Special War Correspondent Jack Shelley speaking from the American First Army on the German frontier. As I was on my way up to the front on one of my recent trips into Germany, I jumped into the headquarters of a military police platoon in the town of Eschweiler to ask directions along my route. After getting the information I wanted, I stood there chatting for a few minutes with the young officer who was on duty in the basement room that served as an office. Weiler, incidentally, an occasion found, and you found you. When I mentioned that I was a correspondent for station WHO in Des Moines, the young officer was mighty interested. WHO, he said. Well, I've listened to your station a million times. I used to travel all through Iowa, and I know WHO mighty well. The officer was Second Lieutenant John J. Sullivan, who now lists Kansas City, Missouri as his home, but who was born in Hamburg, Iowa. He also said he had relatives living near Percival, Iowa. Lieutenant Sullivan represented a safe concern before he left civilian life for the Army, and as part of his job, he was on the road a great deal through the Terracorn State. I know lots of people in Iowa, he said, especially in the grocery trade. Saying goodbye to Lieutenant Sullivan, I followed his advice on the route to follow from one shell-torn captured German town to another, where I made arrangements to see the opening phase of the new attack that started on part of the First Army Front just the other day. It was after watching that action from the muddy top of a hill overlooking the broad plain where the attack was staged that I talked with another soldier from the WHO territory. I heard from the commander of an artillery battalion that there was an Iowa soldier with one of the batteries hurling shells into the German defenses several miles away. The battery was firing a mission at the time, and it wasn't late. So I got permission to... The soldier at the other end of the wire was Private First Class James F. Stubbins of Perry, Iowa. He couldn't get over his surprise at learning that I was watching the action in which his gun was playing a part. I thought they were kidding me at first, he said, when they told me Jack Shelley of WHO wanted to talk to me. Private Stebbins, who has been overseas since the fall of 1942, said it felt mighty good to hear a familiar voice from Iowa yeah, again. Yeah. And he was especially pleased when I told him that through WHO, his mother, sister, and brothers back in Perry would know that I had talked to him. Stebbins was a bridge builder for the Milwaukee Railroad out of Perry in civilian life, and with his artillery battery, he holds the job of gun truck driver. I've been pretty lucky so far, he told me, and I've been getting along just fine. He asked me to be sure to send his Christmas greetings to the folks back in Perry, and I promised I would. Just as we were about to end our conversation, I heard a voice shouting in the background. Stebbins laughed and explained, that was my buddy hollering to the phone. He says to tell you, he says, that I'm what they call a chow hound, and the biggest trouble the army has is feeding me. You mean you've got quite an appetite, I asked? I guess that's right, Stubbins answered. I like to eat, and I guess I do quite a bit of it. Well, tell me, I said, as a fellow who likes to eat, how's the food you're getting? It's really good, Stubbins told me. We can't pick at all about the chow. And that's the picture as it looks to me, too, as I go around this first army front. I've eaten at all kinds of messes, and the meals are tasty and substantial at all of them. Everything I see adds up to the conclusion that this American army of ours is the best fed in the world, which is exactly the way it should be. And to the combat men like Private Stebbins and all the others on the road to Berlin, that means a lot. This is Jack Shelley, WHO's war correspondent on the American First Army Front in Germany. I return you to Des Moines. Hello, NBC. That was the first of my two recordings for tonight. The second and the last one, both of them pleased to be all expressed to the newsroom, radio station WHO, Des Moines, Iowa. The second one will come up in 15 seconds from now. Mm. Greetings again to all my friends of the WHO audience. This is Jack Shelley, your war correspondent with the First United States Army on the German frontier. It isn't exactly a new thing to point out that the steady hammering of this First Army under General Hodges has presented the Germans with a kind of experience that's brand new to them, invasion of their own soil. This military nation that so often has fought its wars on other people's home grounds is seeing the war it chose roll back on its own territory this time. And I don't see how anywhere in the world there can be towns and cities that have been more thoroughly destroyed by shells and bombs than the German areas through which our first army has blasted its way. It's a strange experience for the Germans. It's something they apparently never thought could have happened. 
And as the civilians left in devastated cities like Aachen pick their way through the ruins, they have the dazed appearance of people who still find it hard to convince themselves that this is not just some awful non-Aryan kind of dream. The point was made for me with a touch of irony this week when I visited the command post of an artillery battalion, laying down a curtain of fire for one of the new American attacks on the First Army Front. The battalion had its headquarters some distance away from a massive old stone house. A legend over the entrance said at least part of the structure was built more than 800 years ago. For all those years, until the last few months, that house had been the home of various German noble families. The title feudal lords have always been the backbone of the German military class. In one of the main halls of the ancient house, various noble crests had been placed on the wall, the heraldry of the high-born families who'd lived there. One of the ancient owners had even liked the place so well that his body was buried in one of the stone walls, which made the house a virtual fortress in older days. But the irony came when I had the script on one of the wall decorations translated for me. It ran something like this. This house has stood for hundreds of years, never shaken by war. It's always been occupied by noble German families, and it forever will be German. How hollow that boast is today. The house is in American-held territory now, and near it, American guns receiving telephone reports from observation points, thunder away, hurling out a shower of steel that's pounding still more German towns into ruins. It's all very disillusioning for the Germans, and while most of them are still fighting stubbornly, some of them are glad to give up when they get the chance. The Second Infantry Division has recently passed along a story, by the way, about one such Nazi soldier. Out on one of the fronts, a middle-aged German shouted from the foxhole to Staff Sergeant Cyrus Ainsworth, a gross deck Tuxel. Where are they feeding in the American Army these days, asked the Nazi, as well as in the last war? Better, the Texas boy shouted back. Good, said the German. I want to surrender again. And he gave himself up. The German, who had been fighting in the front lines, had a wooden leg. And he knew what he was doing when he surrendered. But he'd been captured by the Americans in the last war, too. This is Jack Shelley, WHO's war correspondent with the American First Army on the German frontier. I return you to Des Moines. Okay, NBC, that winds up my recording schedule for tonight. Hello, NBC, could I have a report, please? Room, radio station WHO, Des Moines, Iowa. And I'll appreciate a reception report. At it to the newsroom radio station WHO. We're standing by, talking up, ready for this broadcast to be recorded as soon as you give us the go-ahead. Okay, right you are. Second warning. We're standing by, waiting for you to say, go ahead. Jack Shelley, WHO Des Moines, standing by, talking up, in preparation for one eight-minute recording to be sent to Express WHO Des Moines. I will start in 15 seconds from now. Hello, WHO. This is your war correspondent, Jack Shelley, with the American First Army on the German frontier. During this broadcast, we're going to have the real pleasure of hearing the voices of more than a dozen Iowa men, voices that haven't been heard by their families and friends for over a year. This time, the men you'll hear are members of one battery of one of the highest-scoring anti-aircraft outfits in the European Theater of Operations. They are Iowans from Battery B of the 110th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Gun Battalion, stationed somewhere in Belgium. Their battalion landed in France in the very earliest days of the invasion, has seen hot action on the beachhead and the hot rows of the Cherbourg Peninsula, moved on through France and into Paris, where they helped fight off German planes attacking the French capital just after its liberation, and now they're in Belgium. Incidentally, it's been very seldom in my visit to the First Army that I've run across any outfit which has such a pleasingly high concentration of Iowa men as this one. And at this Christmas season, when the home front and the war front are bound together more than ever by strong emotional ties, these men are very glad to have the chance to send their voices and their Christmas greetings back to Iowa. So, without further delay, I'm going to start bringing these anti-aircraft men to the microphone. To start out, here's Private First Class Edwin Miller of Hartley, Iowa. His parents, Mr. and Mrs. Herman Miller, live on a farm six miles out of Hartley, and Edwin's a power plant operator with a battery. Tell me, are you married? 
Yes, I am, Jack. My wife teaches school in Hartley, and I'd sure like to be seeing her this picture. And I know she feels the same way. Even so, this is better than things were for you boys about this time a year ago, isn't it? That's right. At Christmas time a year ago, we were crossing the ocean on just about the roughest ride a ship ever went through. Frankly, all the boys were sick most of the way across. But I believe you've done quite a bit of riding of another kind since then, haven't you? Yes, especially for one period of about two months. I did a lot of truck driving on the famous Red Ball Express Highway, hauling ammunition. Thanks, Edwin. And we know your greetings are on their way to Hartley. Next man up is Corporal Ralph Schultz from Seymour, Iowa, a tractor driver with B Battery. His parents are Mr. and Mrs. George Schultz of Seymour, and Ralph used to be a farmer near that town before he entered the Army. Tell me, Ralph, do you have a wife and family back there? You bet I do. My wife, whose name is Arlene, is staying in Seymour with her folks. She's busy taking care of, her, of our little daughter, who was just one year old the 10th of December. Her name is Marilyn, and I'm sorry to say that I've never seen her. So that's tough. Let's hope you can see her before another Christmas season rolls around. Did your wife come to see more? No, she was living in Corridon, Iowa when we were married. And now her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Otto Hilliard, live in Allerton. And now it's time to hear the voice of a man from Sheraton, Iowa. He's Corporal Seabird Bingham, a 90-millimeter gunner. Seabird, are you married? Yes, my wife Marjorie is living with my folks in Sheraton. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. Charlie Bingham. What did you do in civilian life before you entered the Army, Seabird? I worked for a construction company. We made those big glass containers. You've seen lots of places back home. And here comes another Iowa man, Corporal Donald W. Norton. His parents, Mr. and Mrs. W. S. Norton, live on a farm four miles north of Sanborn. What's your job with this outfit, Don? I'm an ammunition corporal on a 90-millimeter gun job. You've got three brothers and a sister back home. And I believe you told me before the war, you worked on the good black soil of that Iowa farm. Tell me, what do you think of the kind of dirt, or rather yellow mud, you see so much of over here? I don't think much of it. To tell you the truth, I haven't seen any good dirt for a long time. I don't see how grass even grows on some of this stuff. <laughs> well, anyway, that Iowa soil is going to look mighty good when you see it again. I know that. And here we have some representation for Davenport, Iowa. Corporal Richard Brahman, whose parents are Mr. and Mrs. A. H. Brahman of Davenport. What did you do before you entered the Army, Dick? I used to help make machine gun bullets at the Rock Island Arsenal. And now you're helping in the job of delivering bullets to their final destination, eh? Any other relatives back in Davenport whom you're thinking of at Christmas season? Oh, yes. In addition to my parents, there are my young brother and two sisters. My brother has some congratulations coming. He just became a father in October. And then there uh, are my grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Bellman and Mr. and Mrs. R. Edens, all of Davenport. Well, I'm pretty sure they've been listening to your voice right now. Now it's time to introduce Private First Class Keith Baker of Wilton Junction, Iowa, whose mother, Mrs. May Baker, lives in that town. Keith, do you also have a wife back home? Yes, I do, Jack. My wife, Helen, is a beauty parlor operator. And she lives in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, with the farm. We have a little girl, Judith Ann. Just six months old, whom I've never seen. I have also brought five brothers, three of them in Iowa. So you're another one of those army fathers over here who's never seen his firstborn child. Man, I know those folks back there are hoping it won't be long before you can. By the way, Baker, what's your work for the battery? I'm a fuse cutter operator, Jack, for the 9 millimeter gun. Thank you, Keith. Now we hear the voice of a man from Lake Mills, Iowa. It's Sergeant John Benson of Lake Mills, an instrument operator with B Battery. You're another married man, aren't you, John? That's right. My wife is from Albert Lee, Minnesota. I bet this will be a sort of Christmas present for her, to be able to hear your voice from across the sea. And do your folks live in Lake Mills? Yes, my parents are Mr. and Mrs. Elf Stacky, and I have eight brothers, all in Lake Mills. Well, it looks as though just your family alone will make a pretty good audience for this broadcast. Thanks a lot. And now you folks in Sheldon, Iowa, here's one of your boys, Sergeant Wilbur Vanderteig. What's your job with the battery, Sergeant? I'm a chief instrument operator, Jack. Quite a different business from the work I used to do on the farm my folks, Mr. and Mrs. George Vanderteig, had just outside of Sheldon. Well, I should think so. And are your folks still on the farm? No, they recently moved into town. By the way, I've got four brothers and two sisters, all of them around Sheldon, except one sister who's in California. And it will seem mighty good to your family to hear from you this way. Up to the mouth now steps Private Orrin M. Holstead of Northwood, Iowa. 
who is thinking of Christmas greetings these days to his folks on their farm about 10 miles west of Northwood. Tell us what you do with the battery, Owen. I'm an astronaut, man. I'm a 90 millimeter gun. It's a job that involves the pointing of the gun. I believe you told me you used to play some baseball and basketball at Kensett High School. Must be a lot of people around there you'd like to be extending Christmas greetings to about this time if you were back home. Of course, that goes especially for my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Otto Holstead, and for my brothers, and for a lot of other people around Northwood. So greetings it is to Northwood. Now, the fellow who's had to be away from his wife a long time is Corporal Ray Tittleson of Mason City, Iowa. Isn't that right, Ray? It sure is. My wife, Helen, is back in Mason City, and I hope she's listening to this broadcast. I bet she is, all right. They tell me, Ray, you used to be a cook, or rather that you used to work in a packing plant in Mason City, and that now you're a cook with a battery, and a good one. In fact, some of the boys say you're really a morale booster, especially the way you turn out pancakes. Well, I'm glad to learn that somebody actually, actually said, well, I know the boys seem to be able to get away with a good many of those pancakes. Looks to me like you're right about a wonderful man to have around the house when this war's over. And now there's another man from Mason City coming up, Corporal O'Donnell Leon, an instrument man. Is your family back in Mason City, Corporal? No, they're pretty much scattered right now. My mother, Mrs. Ida Leon, was living at Arlington with my sister, and I have a brother who was on the Italian front with the famous 34th Division. But you still consider Mason City to be your hometown, don't you? You bet I do, and I'd like to have the chance to be there during the Christmas season, greeting my relatives and friends. It'll be a great day when you can, won't it? And many thanks to you. There's one other Iowa man who's a member of this battery, but he wasn't able to be here because he's out with the trucks on a detail hauling supplies on the express highway. He's private first class Truman Berryhill of Davenport, a medic. That is a battery aid man. And there are several other men in this battery who at the last minute found themselves unable to get here for the broadcast. We're mighty sorry about it, but here are their names in their Iowa hometown. Private Robert West, a machine gunner from Des Moines, Private James W. Prescott of Sac City, and Private First Class Melvin Eber of Paulina, Iowa. Another one who had to be absent was Corporal Kenneth Lange, also of Paulina. Lange was lucky enough to get a pass that gives him a couple of days in Paris. But all these men told me in advance to say they were thinking of their families at home during this Christmas season. But look, you Iowa boys, who could be on hand. Oh, Robert, for how can I say convention here up on Woman Frontier? What do you say we make it practically official? and make a star of singing the Iowa corn song. Listen, Iowa, this may not sound good, but you can bet your bottom dollar these boys mean it. Here we go. Well, that did it. And as these boys wave their hands above their heads in the traditional ending of the corn song, they're thinking of those cornfields they'll see again one day when this job is done. But before they come back, I'll bet they sing that corn song in the streets of Berlin. Right now, it's goodbye and Merry Christmas from the Iowa men of Battery B, 110th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Gun Battalion, somewhere in Belgium near the German frontier. This is Jack Shelley, WHO's war correspondent speaking, and I will turn you to Des Moines. Okay, NBC, that winds it up. Would you please send that recording, Eric Press, to the newsroom, radio station WHO, Des Moines, Iowa. Start now with a 30 second warning, okay. Waiting for you to tell us if we can go ahead with the first of two recordings for WHO, Des Moines, Iowa. This is Jack Shelley standing by. Okay, NBC, I'll start the first of these recordings in 20 seconds from now. WHO. Once again, your war correspondent, Jack Shelley, is calling from the American First 
I had the pleasant experience the other day of seeing a Belgian town welcome its liberators for the second time. Passing through the little community, I don't suppose it had a population of more than a thousand at the most, I noticed a great many United States Army vehicles discharging men in front of various buildings. Just about every resident of the town was out on the streets to watch the show. There was a broad smile on every face, and the very atmosphere seemed to be filled with a spirit of happiness and welcome. I got out of my jeep to ask the nearest group of American soldiers what it was all about. They told me, and these people are really glad to see us. Because a few months back, on our way into Germany, this same outfit of ours liberated this town. And then I got the story. These yearns were infantrymen of one of the most famous divisions in the army. They had fought around, and to some extent, inside this Belgian town as they battered their way toward the Siegfried Line. They drove out the Germans who had occupied the place for years, and incidentally, they did it without much battle damage to the town itself. They'd been around the community only a short time in that drive ahead to Germany, Belgians, who so gratefully thanked them for freeing them from the Nazis. And now, coming back out of Germany for a rest, these particular doughboys, by one of those rare workings of chance, had been assigned this town as the spot where they were going to get the first relaxation in many months. The people of the town were leaving no stone unturned to let their American liberators know how glad they were to see them again. Belgians, who admit old boys were fighting through that area, were spying familiar faces and eagerly shaking hands. These people are almost fighting with each other, one of the GIs told me, for the chance to take us into their homes and treat us as members of the family. Why, if any one of them thinks he isn't going to get to entertain an American, he's downright sore about it. Every time the vehicle stopped and a load of Yanks got out, a knot of Belgians gathered around them, smiling and chattering their greetings. Girls were shyly walking past the building, but the Americans were setting up their headquarters, grinning at the soldiers. They grinned right back, their teeth gleaming brightly from faces that were still coated with the mud of Germany. Little boys could hardly wait until the driver of a jeep or weapons carrier had gotten behind the wheel to play that they were driving. And it didn't take them long to learn some things. I'd hardly stopped in front of one building when a little Belgian, about eight years old, came up to my jeep. He had two words of English, and he used them right away. Chewing gum, he asked. Avivu, chewing gum? I didn't have, but he got some from a soldier a few seconds later. Up in the center of the town, even before the Yanks came back, the people of the town had paid formal thanks to their liberators. Some weeks before, they'd dedicated a that freed their community from the Germans. They had staged a special ceremony, and the colonel had come back from the front lines for the day to accept the dedication. They tried to tell us, said one of the Yanks who told me about this affair, that when we got deep into Belgium and closer to Germany, we'd find the people less enthusiastic about it than they were in France. Well, believe me, he said, this town is the nicest place we've hit anywhere along the line. As soon as the muddy, battle-stained Americans arrived at any of the homes where they were to be quartered, their host prepared hot baths for them. And there just aren't any words to describe how the first real bath in weeks felt to those weary combat men. That night, they were going to sleep in soft, clean beds, something else they'd almost forgotten about. In fact, the comforts and the personal service their Belgian hosts pressed upon them almost embarrassed some of these men just out of the Spartan life of the front lines. One of the younger officers told me about his experience with a sheepish grin on his face. I go into this house, see, he said, and here's this old Belgian man and his wife just breaking their necks to do things for me. They make me sit down right away in the best chair they've got. And then they bring hot water and towels and tell me to wash my hands and face. And then the old man, he said, gets down and unlaces those muddy old boots of mine and pulls off my socks and he gets the water. And you know what he was going to do? He was going to wash my feet for me. I finally got the idea over that I'd rather do it myself. But can you tie that? He was going to wash my feet for me. Well, the captain may have felt that he was old enough to wash his own feet now. But he knew, and the feeling behind it made him feel mighty good. 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 Well, they owed these American boys more than they could ever really pay. And they just couldn't do enough to let their guests know how glad they were to have them. It warms your heart to see demonstrations like that now and then over here, where there's so much of bitterness and destruction almost everywhere you look. And I only hope that those of us back home will remember too, and never forget it, that we also owe these boys more than we can ever repay. This is Jack Shelley saying goodbye again from the German frontier. I return you to Des Moines. Okay, NBC, that's the end of item number one. I'll be up with item number two, the last one of this group to be out to the newsroom, radio station WHO, Des Moines, Iowa. Number two coming up in 15 seconds from now.
Hello, WHO. This is your war correspondent, Jack Shelley, reporting from the American First Army on the German frontier. The other day, I happened to fall in with a group of young infantry officers who had just arrived in the rest area after months of fighting all the way through France and Belgium into Germany. They invited me to have lunch with them, and I want to tell you a few of the stories that flew around the table as we had our meal. It was a very good meal, by the way, in spite of the fact the outfit had just arrived and set up its kitchen. And later, I met one of the cooks who prepared the tasty food. He was technician fifth grade Robert Frizzell of St. Joseph, Missouri, who said he often listened to WHO at home. It's been a couple of years since Frizzell was back in St. Joe with his wife. He's got a daughter almost two years old back there, whom he's never seen. But about the conversation at the luncheon table, these young officers just out of the front line were as full of enthusiasm and spirit as if they'd never seen a foxhole. They recalled especially hot moments in their battles, laughed about this close call or that one. And it was almost hard to believe that these were men who had brushed the wings of death a hundred times a day, who had seen their comrades die around them, and who knew that before long, they'd be going back to the front again. Instead, they seemed more like members of a football team, sitting around a training table, laughing and arguing about the plays in yesterday's game with the rival squad. They told about the night part of their outfit had worked its way into a few houses of a German village, with the Nazis unaware of their presence. Later in the night, they heard the tramp of heavy boots, and peering out from their houses, they saw hundreds of Germans stamping by in virtual parade formation. If the Nazis had learned the handful of Yanks were there, if one of the Americans had made a false out, as they told about it back in this rest area, the young officers laughed and laughed. It all seemed very funny now. They also told me some almost fantastic stories of even closer individual scrapes with death. One soldier in their outfit was working his way down the side of a German street during house-to-house fighting when a Nazi sniper fired. The boy staggered for a moment, his rifle dropped from his hands, and he died in the nearby doorway. Afterward, they learned the German bullet had struck the rifle, completely wrecking the trigger mechanism. Then the bullet had glanced off into the Yankee soldier's cartridge belt, had ripped through the casing of several of his own cartridges, igniting the powder in them and causing it to flow up. It then passed through the soldier's jacket, ripped through his underwear, and then sped on. The boy wasn't hurt, he wasn't even scratched. But as the officer said, he was mighty nervous for a while after. Another story, and the officer swore that these were true, was about the young American soldier who got in the path of a Nazi machine gun. The German gunner was swinging his stream of lead from side to side as if he were spraying alone. The amazing feature of the story is the Yank was nipped in just a split second through just the lobes of his ears, first the right ear and then the left. I'd always thought of machine gun fire as a steady stream, almost like water from a hose. But there was just enough dispersion between two bullets from this gun, immediately following each other, that they missed only the American's ears, as they passed barely on either side of his head. Otherwise, he wasn't hurt. Well, those are stories the young officers just out of the line told me. Maybe they're a bit humorous, but if so, they're mighty rare. There isn't much about this war over here that's funny. It isn't funny at all. This is Jack Shelley, your war correspondent with the American First Army. I return you from the German frontier to Des Moines. Okay, NBC, that's the last announcement for tonight. Well, NBC, could I have a report, please? Hello, NBC, plus wireless, could I have a report, please? Not right now. There's some recordings.